Good morning, everyone. So glad you're here. The psalmist said in Psalm 145, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's put our hands together. We serve a great God and he's done so many incredible things. Even this summer, and all our missions giving and missions going, discipleship that's taken place, God is doing amazing things even here at First Baptist Rogers. Let's give him thanks as we sing this. Come on, sing it out. Oh, come let us worship our King. Come on, sing it from your heart. Come let us bow at His feet, for He has done great things. You sound good this morning. And see what our Savior has done. And see how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Boy, He has done great things. Of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great. Lord, we dance your freedom. Awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great. If you agree with what we're singing, would you just say yes? It's important for us to be connected by His Spirit and lift our praise to Him. You've been faithful to every storm, and you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Oh, and I know you will do it again. Lord, for your promise is a yes. Amen. Oh, you will do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Come on, put your hands together. Let's sing. You conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great. Lord, we dance your free. He is greatly to be praised. Let's sing hallelujah to him. Come on, church. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. That is worth singing again. Come on, every voice. Hallelujah, God. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, oh, you free every captive and break every chain, oh, God, you have done great So thankful for our singing faith. Would you stand together as we declare these truths together? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. 
sound good this morning, singing the truths of scripture, encouraging each other with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Keep singing. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoice, for story.
morning. It's good to see you this morning. I hope you're having a great week and a, a great day today. What a great day. The Bible says that this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And man, I don't know of a better place to be than right here worshiping the Lord. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us. We have a lot of guests this time of the year. Some of the folks are visiting some of their family here. Uh, and then also there are people that are moving always this time of year. We're, we're told 30 people a day are moving to northwest Arkansas, and this is a time that a lot of people move. And so if you're new to the area, we'd love to get to know you just a little bit better. After the service, I'll, I'll be standing just down here on my left. I would love to meet you and visit with you for just a moment before the next service begins if you have time for that. If you're watching online, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you spending time with us. Just a reminder that we always have people praying for us during our worship services, and there are people praying for us right now. And if you have a prayer need, if you'll text the number on the screen, someone will pray for you right now, right at the time that you send that text. And also, if you have a question, if you need some help, or uh, if, if you need to make a spiritual decision, you can text that number and let us know how we can, uh, we can help you, how we can walk alongside you. That's why we're here. That's what, that's what we do. We want to continue our worship uh, through a time of prayer together. So I want to invite you to join with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we bless your name and we praise you. And Lord, we have sung and declared that in, in you, Christ alone, we find our strength, we find our hope, and, and we declare there is none like you, there is none beside you. And Lord, we come to you uh, in humility before you, we bow our knee, we, we assume a posture of, of lowliness because you are great and mighty, and if we say we have no sin, we are a liar, the truth is not in us, but if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we do not pretend that we are a people that don't need to appropriate the cleansing power of, of your grace. And so we ask, Lord, that you would convict us of our sins, search our hearts and know our ways, and, Lord, that you would bring us under conviction. And we thank you for the forgiveness that you freely give through the shed blood of Christ. And, and Lord, we also pray for those who are struggling today, those who are hurting, those who have emotional distress in their life, though maybe a, a broken relationship, a broken heart, disappointment. God, that you would, uh, you would give peace and, and hope to people today. We, we pray for uh, the family of, of Betty Townsend as, as uh, we all grieve Betty's death, but we rejoice in her home going and being with Mel now and with Jesus most importantly. And Lord, we thank you for people like the Townsends that have really been the essence of who, who this church is and has been through the years. And, and God, we know that there are many of us that are, are struggling. We have friends, we have family, we have our own lives that are in disarray. And, and God, we just uh, we cast our cares upon you for you care for us. And Father, we do stand in the gap and we pray for these mission teams as they've left and uh, that, that you would give them traveling grace, and Lord, that you would give them fruit for their labor. I pray that you would plant the seed of, of mission endeavor and missional living in the hearts of our young people, that they would live their entire life on mission for you, and that even out of this large group that's going all across America, that you would raise up uh, preachers of the gospel and missionaries, uh, and Lord, that we would be a good steward of of these young men and women that you're raising up in, in our midst. And, and Father, we do pray for the preacher today that you would help him as he is certainly one who needs much help. You would anoint him to preach the word of God, that you'd give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. We pray for our friends that uh, maybe do not know you, Lord Jesus, as Lord and Savior, that today might be that day that you might bring them under the conviction of their need of you, their sin, and also convince them of the truth of the gospel and Lord, we pray that you would, uh, you would uh, impact this body, that your hand would be upon us, that we would, we would know the presence of God, we'd walk in the presence of God, and Lord, that because of that, we would share the, share the good news of Christ with those around us. We pray for our friends at the persecuted church that gather all over the world that uh, are gathering with, with great risk uh, to their family, to their own 
self, and, and we pray for them. We thank you for uh, the churches that are gathered. We pray for our Olive Street campus and, and Brock as he preaches, that you would, you would work mightily there. And thank you for the doors that you're opening for us to expand ministry, expand opportunity uh, for your glory, for your kingdom. I pray these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 23 in just a moment. I'm going to be talking to you about the shadow, the substance, and the sufficiency of Christ. We are in the midst of a series that we have entitled Filled and Fruitful. The, the prayer of Paul for these believers at Colossae was that they, would be, that they would be filled with the knowledge of Jesus and that they would be uh, fruitful, they would bear fruit in every good work. And so... In essence, what he was praying about was also the the fact that they were being tempted in what his scholars have called the Colossian heresy. Although it is not distinctly defined and detailed, it is certainly some type of heresy that uh, was a syncretization of the gospel with an asceticism, with a Judaism, and also some mysticism thrown in there. It was just kind of a smorgasbord of adding to the gospel And so today we're going to be talking about the shadow that the law represented in the Old Testament in particular and how these heretics were bringing the the shadow of the law and and imposing that upon the gospel and tempting and causing these believers to add to the gospel. And as you think about a shadow, a shadow is really something that is reflective, it is something that uh, let you know something's there. It's when an, an object gets between the, the, the light source and, and a surface, and you can see a dark spot or a, a shadow, so to speak. In the Greek culture, it was not a negative kind of idea of like lurking in the shadows, uh, but, but it was predictive It was uh, as it was used. And, and so the things that are talked about in this passage of Scripture as far as the Sabbaths and new moons and food and drink and and festivals and things like that, they were Old Testament prescriptive uh, things that they were told to do in order for them to look ahead to one who was coming. And so sometimes we can get caught up in the ceremony, and a lot of that was ceremony. If if you've ever graduated from anything, you you may have uh, put a cap and gown on, uh, you may have uh, stood and uh, had your name called uh, out and walked across a stage, and you maybe were given a, a diploma or something like that, and, uh, and, and that was the ceremony. And, but that ceremony represented a lot of hard work, and it also represented anticipation and hope of what was going to happen next. And, and the reality is that you don't live in a ceremony. You don't... You don't live with a cap and gown on, you, you move on. It, it's reflective of, of what's happened in the past and it's anticipating what's going to happen ahead. And much of the things that we're going to talk about today, and this is a very challenging passage of scripture that a lot of scholars uh, say, but I know you're, you're such a top level group, this is going to be no problem for you uh, to be for sure. But the shadow is not the substance, but Christ is the substance. But we're going to be talking about that. And, and you've heard me say this before, would you rather get run over by the shadow of a bus or by the bus? And on the other hand, if it's raining and cold outside, would you rather be standing under the shadow of a house or would you rather be in the house? And, and the reality is that Christ is the substance. And throughout the book of Colossians, Paul over and over again, he emphasizes the preeminence of Christ, that in all things he might have first place. He he emphasizes that Christ is all in all, that we have been baptized in Christ and we have been raised with him, and that our sufficiency is in Christ, that Christ is sufficient. He is enough. And he is more than enough, and the gospel is sufficient, and we don't have to add to the gospel. We don't have to help the gospel out with anything else. And so that's the essence of what he's talking about in this passage of Scripture, in this section. And so if you have found Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, and you are, if you're physically able, I want to ask you to stand with me in honor of the Lord as we read his word. And the Bible says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge 
in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. Taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence." Father, thank you that your word is true. Thank you that it always accomplishes its purposes and it never returns void. Uh, Bless it, Lord, to your people today and transform us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Paul has, as I've already mentioned, emphasized throughout this book the preeminence of Christ and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ in all matters. That Jesus is enough, and that is somewhat simplistic, and yet it is greatly profound. It is enough to keep you occupied for the rest of your life in researching and searching the depths of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we, as believers, we are connected to Christ. We have seen that we are in Him, we are with Him, that we are baptized with Him in His death, we are raised with Him. And so we are inseparably connected to Christ, and so because of that, we should have great joy, and because of that, we should not let others come and accuse us, and we should not let others come and steal the joy that God has given us by our relationship in Christ. There are three warnings in chapter 2. We have already seen one of those in verse 8 where he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. And here we see the second warning in verse 16 where he says that therefore no one is to act as your judge. So don't let anyone act as your judge in these matters that he lists, food, drink, feast, new moon, Sabbaths, And and he says they are only shadows. And so do not allow the ceremonial things, the the things that have been prescribed in the Old Testament that are representative and predictive, don't let those things be added to the gospel, added to what is required in order for you to go to heaven and also in order for you to grow in your relationship with Christ. And and so he, he warns them about that. And then there's a third warning that we see in verse 18, where he says, don't let anyone keep defrauding you of your prize. Those joy stealers that would come and defraud. In in the issues that he mentions there are self-abasement, the worship of angels, and also visions that ultimately lead to arrogance and being cut off from the head who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to consider this morning three actions that I hope will help you and me to avoid Uh, this kind of temptation in our life, and most importantly, that we would hold on to the head and that we would recognize and depend upon the sufficiency of Jesus Christ and keeping Him primary and trusting in Him in every area of our life. The first thing I want you to notice is that we need to be aware of the difference between the shadow and the substance. The shadow is not the real thing. The shadow is representative. The shadow is indicative in some form or fashion, but it is not the substance. In this case, the substance is Christ. Everything points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. The law serves as a shadow, is what the Bible teaches. The law was given in order to let us know about Christ. It was not given to save us. It's not given to make us righteous or make us holy before God. 
the law was given in order that we might see that we need Christ to point out that we are sinners. The problem is that sometimes we mistake the shadow for the substance and we emphasize it and we begin to focus more on the outward instead of really being concerned with the inward. And that's what Paul is warning these folks about. They had the real thing. (laughs) They had experienced the transforming work of Christ. And so don't doubt in the light what, what someone else is coming in the dark and tempting you with. In verse 16, the Bible says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. We could call these things maybe under the category of ceremonialism, something that God gave. He gave ceremonial law. He gave dietary law. He gave the moral law. He gave all of that in the Old Testament to the the children of Israel so that they would be a separated people from all the other nations, so that people would know that this group of people belongs to the Lord. This was a polytheistic culture that that existed. And so this was a unique thing. And so this was a way that that God would mark his people. But it was more than that. It was also anticipatory. It was predictive of what was to come. It was a way that these people would be separated unto the Lord, but also a way that they could anticipate what God was going to be doing in the future. And so he makes some uh, observations about these these festivals and new moons and Sabbath, and, and, and in doing so, he brings them up to, to date, and he makes them Christological. He makes them eschatological in the fact that it is, it is speaking of Christ, and it's also speaking of the future, of looking ahead to the culmination of all things. He, he talks about festivals. You, you think about the Passover meal, and there, there are many festivals that we could reference, but the Passover meal is one that we're, we're very familiar with, and, and we know in our observance of the Lord's Supper that, that Jesus took the Passover meal and he made it into the Lord's Supper. And they certainly did not know that was going to happen, and in some way they, they saw it as that commemoration of the, their rescue from Egyptian bondage. But as, as time passed and the prophets prophesied, especially as the New Testament came about, that, that it became clearer and clearer that it was really speaking of something that was to come. And more than something that was to come, someone who was about to come. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1, and you may want to write that down or mark it or flag it or something, it says this, for the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. And so what we see is that the law was never given in order to make people perfect. It was never given to, to, to make people right with God. It was an act of faith on their part that they participated in the the sacrificial system, but they had to keep doing it over and over and over and over again because the blood of bull and goats could not eradicate their sin. But you see, that's the difference in the substance of the cross and Christ is that it does eradicate sin. It's a once-for-all payment for sin, and it eradicates sin from our life and guarantees us heaven because we have trusted in Christ. And so we see the sufficiency of that. And, and these new moons and these festivals, they, they incorporated the sacrificial system through, throughout those festivals in order that they might have sin covered. But in reality, it was anticipating and looking for one that would come one day and fulfill the law. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 23, it says, but before faith came... We were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Verse 24, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. The law was given in order that we might see that 
we can't keep the law. You know, some people say, well, I'll just, I'll live by the Ten Commandments. Well, how's that working for you? <laughs> uh, I can tell you how it's working. It's not working very good because you can't keep the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, you can't, probably can't even keep one of the Ten Commandments. You probably violated every single one of them. The reality is the law is given to show us that we are in desperate need. We are in need of the grace of God. We are in need of what we cannot do for ourselves. We can't help ourselves. We can't fulfill the law. And it is a tutor, it is a, a teacher to us showing us that we need Christ. We need grace. We, we don't want to be left upon our own. We don't want what we deserve. We desperately need the gospel. We, we need what only God can do for us. And so that's the purpose of the law. And that's always been the purpose of the law. As a matter of fact, even before the law was given, the Bible says that Abraham, who predated the law, Abraham, who also gave tithes, predating the law too, but anyway, that's a, that's a whole different subject there. But anyway, but uh, Abraham predating the law, it says Abraham believed God... And it was counted in him righteousness. People have always been saved by grace through faith. Even in the Old Testament. When people say, well, how were people in the Old Testament saved? They were saved by faith. They were saved by grace through faith. That Noah found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. Abraham believed God and it was counted in him righteousness. And the same is true, especially today, that it's not by our works or our deeds that we are saved, but through the grace of God through what God has done in Christ, that that people are saved. And you see, that is radically different than what so many people understand. And and you hopefully understand that. You're blessed to be able to to know that. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there, they don't know that. They think they've got to be good. They think they've got to do this, that, the other thing. They're, They're working their way. They're trying to be good enough. They're trying to improve their position before God so that they can be accepted and embraced by Him. And they've got this scale thing going and all of that. And and they don't know. They don't understand. And the law is given to show us how desperately wicked we are, how desperately we need God, how desperately we need the grace of God in our lives. And then we see basically that the shadow is not the real thing. The shadow, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the, the festivals, uh, the drink and the, and, the, and the food, all of those things, those are pointing to something. They're, they're not bad in and of themselves, but they are the shadow and they are not the substance. It's kind of like, would you rather have a really nice diamond-filled wedding ring or a good marriage? You know, one of them is representative and a symbol And the other one is the reality. I would imagine there's probably a lot of nice diamond rings out there that don't have such great marriages going with them. But I know when Lisa and I got married, there was a it was a speck of a diamond (laughs) that you couldn't hardly see. I I probably couldn't see it at my age now. I probably couldn't see it, but uh, uh, especially as I continue to be stubborn and don't use bifocals yet. But uh, uh, and all, but but what's important is the marriage, and what's important is Jesus. It's not all the ceremonialism, it's not all of the decor, it's not all, and 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 those are not necessarily wrong. And and one of the things we can look at is the Lord's Supper, that it, there is an appropriate way to partake and participate in the Lord's Supper. But I'm telling you, that Lord's Supper isn't going to save you. I mean, you can eat, you know, some of, like, well, man, I need three loaves of bread, you know, as bad as, I mean, some of you probably do, but, but the, the reality is that it doesn't do any good in that regard. It is representative. It is causing us to remember his death and anticipate his return as often as you do that until the Lord returns, that we anticipate his return. And so we don't need to mix up the shadow with the substance and Jesus Christ is the substance. That's why we're a Jesus church. <laughs> if you walked in here today, wandered in here today for the very first time, I pray that you, of everything that you know, that you know we love Jesus and we are, we are head over heels about Jesus. We're, it's all about Jesus. We are unapologetically Jesus first. He is preeminent over everything. The second thing that we need to do is that we need to be resolved to hold fast to the head, because we are told in verses 18 and 19 that 
they did not hold on to the head. And so we need to be resolved to hold on to the head, to keep Jesus first, to, to stay connected with him and, and give him priority of certainly those of us who have been genuinely saved by the gospel, that, that God is the one who keeps us. He'll finish the work he started in us and, and all of that. But there is a responsibility on our part also to participate with him in that work. In verse 18 it says, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels and taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. The second command is to not let people defraud you of your prize, not let people be a joy stealer. And the way they steal our joy is listed there in a number of ways. The first one there is that of, of, uh, of, of self-abasement. And, and before we talk about those details, that the whole idea behind this, we could just probably summarize it by, by there's, there's those who, who make people think there's, uh, there's something more and their way of doing things is a better way of doing it. And, and I have some friends, they call sometimes this group of people or these uh, certain groups of these people scavengers almost, that they, they never lead anybody to Jesus. They just take people that are already believers and they, they make them feel like they're missing something. They're, there's more out there. There's more. Listen, I want you to know there's nothing more than Jesus. You can't get any better than Jesus you don't, I mean, when you have Jesus, you have it all. Now, you, there may be some things you need to learn and, and, and grow deep with Jesus, all those kinds of things. But my friend, I want you to know, when you have Jesus, you have everything you need. He is sufficient for everything. And, and one of the things he ta- they talk about is self-abasement. And that is a, an asceticism. It is, a, it is a, you know... You know, neglecting your body or punishing your body or, or some kind of thing like that. Uh, that's the first, uh, there's a, a number of these phrases here. And, and it, it has that idea of disciplining our body and in, in doing so it, with the idea that it improves our position with God. And, and listen, all of y'all that have a weight problem, y'all are going to be, y'all are excited about this. I know that. And, and that's most of us uh, uh, around and, and all. But uh, but but there's nothing to this, uh, you know, being a monk and and disciplining yourself and all of those kinds of things. It's uh, the you know buffet the body kind of thing. And, but but our focus should be on spiritual things. That should be our fem- our focus. We should be more focused on on serving Jesus and knowing about Jesus than anything else. I mean, it's more important for your ten year old to know who Jesus is than whether or not they can hit a hit a baseball or not. Hello. And listen, that, and so we need to give emphasis to the importance and the significance of Jesus in our life. Not so much, and I think we need to be a good steward of the opportunities that we, we have. We need to be a good steward of our bodies and all of that. But self-abasement in order that we might improve our position with God and look down on other people in judgment is sinful. It is wrong. And so these people, they were using that. And second, it says delighting in the worship of angels. And this was certainly a problem in that day and time, and it is a, it, in, in, in mysticism and those kinds of things continue to be a problem. And in the third participial clause, it, it really dovetails into, into that. It says, taking his stand on the visions he has seen. There is that mysticism, spiritism kind of thing of, of having visions. It is that extra-biblical experience and judges, judging other people based upon their lack thereof. But I want you to know there is a, there is a danger to these extra-biblical experiences that are especially not tethered to the Scripture. And uh, there are groups of people, that have always, they've always been around, they'll always will be around, who uh, they, they have a word from God, they, uh, you know, they have visions and dreams. And listen, I believe every word of the Bible, and I believe that in, in the last days, the old men will dream dreams and young men will have visions or vice versa, whichever way it goes. I can't remember exactly right here on the spot. But I believe that. I believe all of that, but I also know this, that, that when, I, when somebody comes up and they tell me that they've had a dream or they've had a vision, man, that just sort of, I'm like, man, I don't know what to do. I mean, because how do I know? I mean, how do I know? I mean, I don't know. I mean, 
we're tied to the objective truth of God's Word. And, uh, man, I tell you, there are people who said they've had stuff, and I, I know they didn't get that from God. I mean, uh, they, they, I know that. So how do you know? How do I know? You know, we've done, I don't know how many building programs. We've, we've probably had done seven or eight, something like that, in the 20 years I've been here. It's just like all the time, right? So, and all. But one thing that I have never, in all of that time, I've never had God tell me, you need to build this building. I've never stood in this pulpit and said, God told me that we need to build. I, I've never done that. I don't anticipate that ever happening. Now, next week or tomorrow, this, tonight, I may have, but I, that's never happened to me. I've, you know, I've tried to look and say, well, you know, do we need to do this? You know, we're running out of space. I talk to other people in the church. We pray, God, don't let us make a mistake. Don't let us get in the ditch. Keep us on the, on the main road. You can stop it anytime you want to. And we, we pray a lot of prayers like that. So it, it really concerns me sometimes when people are, have so much certainty about certain things that you can't even find in the Bible. And so the, the, the word for us is this, is man, be, be more focused and more committed and more certain and more sure about what you see in the Bible. And especially do not think that there's this upper class of Christian that has these visions. And, and in this case, these visions led in the, next very, the very next phrase goes on, it says, the, uh, they inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Because they were having these visions, alleged visions, it was causing them to become arrogant. Well, we know the Bible says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. I mean, I mean God isn't given that vision. Man, God's against that. I mean, God is opposed to that. And so we need to be tethered to the truth of Scripture the objective truth of tr Scripture, God has given us His Word. And we need to focus on the Word of God that He has given us once for all, delivered to the saints. And that needs to be our focus. And we need to be careful. We need to be cautious about the subjectivism that, that comes from personal experience and elevating personal experience above God's Word. And even my own personal experience, I mean, we may have a personal experience in, 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 in our understanding of it because our understanding is so flawed, even on our best day, that, that we may miss the one thing where God was really doing. We may think this other sideline thing was something that God was doing when God was really doing this. Listen, what we need to focus on is the Word of God because that transforms everybody's life. It moves across experience, and it is more true than our experience is what the Word of God says. It will last and it will live forever. And so we need to focus on that. And, and we see that this private vision, it isolates and it puffs up where knowing Christ and being connected to the head, that it humbles us and it brings us together as the body. And so uh, someone said this, uh, said it, it was emotionally elating, ego inflating, and worst of all, brother berating. And so that's exactly what was going on there. And so the fifth participle clause there is that the, the, the error at its root was that they were not holding fast to the head. And we see Paul continuing to give extreme importance to the preeminence of Christ and being connected to him and the importance of knowing him. And doctrinal error that leads to aberrant belief and behavior can be avoided when we keep Christ first place. The person and work of Christ, and not in isolation from the body. Notice in that verse it says, From whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. That it's the entire body. That our spiritual growth is connected to being a part of the body, not in isolation as an individual over here growing all by myself, but no, I grow in relation to the body as the whole body. Wouldn't it be weird to say, man, I tell you what, my nose is really growing big these days. And, you know, nose is going, I mean, it, my, you know, my, my little finger is really taking off. It's uh, really, you know, and no, it's not individual. It's, it's the body, and we grow with the body. That's why it's so important that we be a part of the community of Christ. All of these uh, pronouns, these uh, second person pronouns, the yous are all you alls. They are plural 
in, in, in the promises and in the instructions and in the commands are for us together. It's not us alone in isolation. And so we see that, that we grow with the growth which is from God. So we reject, we reject the prize defrauders, the joy stealers, those who elevate themselves and then look down on us, look down on you and, and try to make you feel guilty because you don't live up to their, their self-made religion but know that you have joy because of who you are in Christ, because you know that Jesus is sufficient, and you have Jesus, and you have every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ Jesus. You have everything pertaining to life and godliness in Christ, and, and because of that, you can have joy. You have it all. <laughs> you have it all in Him. And so, and He is the one who is giving, He is the one who is causing this growth. And so we re- resist these self focused experiences of, of visions and, and, and worship of angels and, and, and self-abasement. We, we reject these things of the flesh that elevate a person. No, we, we submit to the lordship of Christ and we hold on to the head and we're refreshed and we're renewed because of that. And the third thing I want you to see is that we are to be aware of the substitutions of self-made religion. It is the shadow. There's nothing necessarily wrong with the shadow as long as we don't substitute it for the substance we need to hold on to Christ and keep him first. And in doing so, we will we'll put away self-abasement. We'll put away the mysticism and worship of angels and chasing after visions. And then also, we will not succumb to self-made religions. Look there in verse 20. It says, if you died with Christ to so the elementary principles of the world. So the, this is a condition. And it is a first-class condition. So it's, it's like since you died. It is, there's a certainty to it that since you died, then why are you doing this other stuff is, is the question. And he asks the rhetorical question associated with it. But I want us to think just a, a little bit about these elementary principles. If you have died with Christ, you've died to these elementary principles of the world. And there's always going to be a temptation that the world offers to try to help out the gospel. That, you know, boy, if we just could add a little bit of psychology here, we could add a little critical theory here, we could add a little bit of this, it would really help us to, to reach our community better, it would help us to understand people better and all of that. And listen, I'm a pretty open-minded kind of guy about stuff. I mean, I want to be educated and I want to know what's going on. But my friend, when you begin to add to the gospel, it is dangerous. I mean, it's like mixing just a little bit of poison in the water. It's just bad. It's not a good thing because the gospel is sufficient. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It's not psychology. It's not critical theory. It's not some political idea. It's not some social movement. It's none of that. It is the gospel. And the greatest need that people have is they are lost in their sin. That is the biggest problem that everyone has. That's the problem of this nation. That's the problem of people across the waters and other nations. And all, yes, there are poverty issues. There's class issues. I believe in all of those kinds of things. But I do believe that the Bible clearly says that the greatest need that everybody has is that they're lost without Christ because all these other issues are temporary. They're temporary. I mean, there's going to be a day that comes when Jesus splits the sky and he comes back and he reconciles all things to himself. Those things are going to be gone. There's not going to be any racism after he comes. There's there's not going to be any poverty after. There's not going to be any of those kinds of things when he comes. Those are temporary, but but there is an eternal problem and it is lostness. And there's eternal death awaiting those who are lost without Christ. And that's why we stick to Christ and we preach him and we proclaim him. And we don't need pragmatism, uh, politicalization, social media police, uh, social media self-exaltation, creating false narratives, uh, anything like that. The insinuation that the gospel is not sufficient, that we've got to help it out, we've got to add to it, and we've got to redefine it. I'm telling you, that, that's from the pit of hell, and I tell you, it's a ploy of the enemy to distract us and to keep us from preaching the gospel. Because the gospel is what changes people's lives. The gospel is what transforms people's lives. And it's so simple, but it's so profound that people stumble over it. That's why the Bible says about the gospel, about the preaching of the cross, that it is a stumbling block to those who do not believe. And to everyone that does not believe, it is foolishness. But to those who believe, it is the power of God. 
And so that's why we preach the gospel. That's why we stick to Christ. That's why we don't add to the gospel of Christ. So we don't need to be led astray by worldly philosophies and secular modification of the once for all settled gospel that's been delivered to the saints. And then he goes on in verse 20. He says, why? As if you were living in the world. He, he said that if, if you've, you've died with Christ, then why? Why as if you were living in the world do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. Why are you doing these things when, you know, you know you can't get to heaven by what you, what you do and what you don't do. You only get to heaven by the grace of God. So why are you trying to do all this stuff? Why are you putting that stuff on everybody else? It's not, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help them. And verse 23 says, These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. It appears to be wise, but it's of no value. Spiritually speaking, it's of no value. It is self-made religion. This self-abasement, severe treatment of the body, it's, it's of, of no value. As a matter of fact, what he says in this text is that that, that treatment actually leads to self-indulgence. That those who seem to major on those kinds of things, being obsessed with their body or obsessed with their, their outward form or their, their monasticism or whatever it might be, that eventually and deep down, those people are really filled with themselves. They're self-exalting. And they become self-indulgent. And we've even seen some of that over time. That some of the people that were the don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. They, they end up being exposed as doing some of the most horrific things that, that you would, could ever imagine. Because it doesn't work because we need the gospel. We need the grace of God. It's what we need. We don't need more of ourself. <laughs> more of ourself just messes it up more and more. We need more of Jesus. We need the gospel. It's what we need. Paul sees the self-made religion as a sham, as a do-it-yourself religion, that it, that, it, that it does nothing. But the primacy and sufficiency of Christ is what overcomes worshiping the shadow and adding to the gospel. So we're warned that we should avoid ceremonialism, dietary law. We're to avoid asceticism. We're to avoid the worship of angels and mysticism. We're to avoid legalism. We don't need to think that we can gain the favor of God by doing this and doing that and not doing this and then imposing that on other people. That we are desperately in need of Christ. Instead, we should embrace the substance of who Christ is and that we should hold on to the head. That is what God has called us to do. Would you bow your head with me in prayer? Church family, God has spoken to us that as we go through this journey that we would not get caught up in things that, that distract from the essence of the gospel. That we would not make idols of, of things that are maybe not bad. And some of these things might even have had a benefit in a, in a day in the past time. But some, some people are trying to hold on to an old tradition that, is, that served well and served for a season. But that season has passed. And in doing our holding on to and making an idol of some things, we are neglecting the head. We're neglecting Christ. And oh, dear friend, you and I should do nothing <laughs> that would distract from the essence of who Jesus is. The beauty of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the magnificence of Jesus. We don't have to redefine him to fit the culture of this day. We just need to worship the Jesus of the Bible. We need to preach Him and, and who He is. And yes, he, He's the one who says, go and sin no more. And he's the one who has the power to help people to go and sin no more. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, we always want to let people know how they can know Christ because Pretty much every Sunday we have people here for the very first time. And if you're here for the very first time or you're watching online for the very per first time and you've never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, 
But God today has convinced you that you need Christ, convinced you that you're a sinner, convinced you that the gospel is true. And the Bible says, Jesus said this, unless the Father draws you, you cannot come to me. But you believe the Father's drawing you right now. The Spirit of God is drawing you right now. If that's you, then I want to help you do what God is calling you to do and what you really want to do today. If you want to trust Christ, would you pray this prayer with me and say, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead. I turn from my sin and I trust in Jesus and him alone for my eternal salvation. I receive this gift that I cannot earn and that I do not deserve. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, would you text that number on the screen if you're watching online, if you're here in the room, if you take that connection card and you'll, you can fill that out, just put your name and just some contact information. There's a box you can check. Today, I want to receive Christ. You can just write it in the prayer request. Or maybe you've got some questions about it. Maybe you're not ready to make that commitment, but you have questions, you have an interest. Just let us know that. Let us know. You can take that card, you can hand it to me. I'm going to be standing down here on, on my left, your right, after the service, and you can hand that card to me, or you can drop it in the offering boxes as you leave. But man, don't get out of here without letting somebody know it's too important to not let somebody know that you're trusting Christ. You can also text that number on the screen and let us know that.